So Charlie Bono, he is a retired U.S. Air Force colonel, and he's also retired from TRW Northrop Grumman, where he was a senior manager. I think that's enough. And he works on ICBM. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So, um, yeah, there seems to be more and more interest in Minuteman. Last time I came here, I talked on a slightly different subject. There seem to be a lot of interest in this one, and this is one I presented before. So, in fact, I used to teach the uh, general familiarization course to the civil servants out of Hill Air Force Base on Minuteman. You won't. This is not a three-hour intensive general familiarization. It's more of a top-level overview, but I think you'll get something out of it. What are you recording? So, um, I suppose what, while I'm distracted by this, I should be saying I pulled all of this information off of the internet. I had you know, a lot of sources when I was doing this and getting paid to do it. I had a lot of official use only, um, sensitive, classified information. None of that I brought over to my personal computer, so I just went and pulled stuff off the internet to give you sort of the top level view. Nothing here will get any of us in trouble. In fact, I gave this presentation recently in front of some folks who work on Minuteman for a living and they agreed that there wasn't anything in here that we'll get in trouble for. Uh, next chart. What we're going to talk about is the mission of the Minuteman ICBMs. And then we'll talk about uh, the missile itself, is which what most people think of when they think of ICBMs, they think of the missile. But actually the weapon system is a lot more than that, so we'll talk about that too. Uh, next chart. And this is, like I said, I didn't need to introduce myself because it's all here. The main thing to know on this chart is I have a website called charlesmuller.com. And if you don't find these charts in the video I'm going to show on the NCOSI website, you can always go to my website and find it. And uh, Chris here is, thank you Chris for uh, doing the video, and I'll post this video up on that website too. I'm a uh, AIAA, I'm a member of NCOSI, but I'm also an associate fellow in AIAA, and I'm a distinguished lecturer in AIAA. So, um, I like to post things on my website so people can see the sorts of presentations I give. So I got a bunch of degrees, um, done a lot of things including Air Force pilot, uh, inertial upper stage. So basically in this assignment I was refueling SR-71s to go spy on the Soviets to make sure they weren't doing something bad to us during the Cold War. In this assignment, we were launching spy satellites to keep an eye on the Soviets to make sure they weren't doing something bad to us in the Cold War. And then I went from that to working about 25 years in ICBMs. So that's why when you go to my website, it says retired Cold Warrior, because it's basically what I've been doing my whole career. And no, the Cold War isn't over. Ivan still has got his missile, we got our missiles. Uh, retired from TRW North of Grumman. Other interests, I mentioned these. Uh, Paul and I are both members of uh, the Utah Engineers Council, which is a great organization that I think, Amy, you were thinking of maybe having the, a, the Material Society might join. And one of the things that we do is in the fall, we put up a STEM booth at Comic Con. So you're, you're willing, you're welcome to join us in doing that, whether you're a member of UDC or not. Um, and then if you Google my name um, and look for me, what you'll find is my wife, who is the turtle lady and uh, rescues turtles, so she's more famous than me. Uh, that's enough of that. Next trip. And that's a picture of the website so that you can tell, okay, click on that menu item and go look for the charts there if you want to see it. Next trip. 
So this is the same overview before, but with more detail under each one. And what I want to say about mission is that if you have a complex system or any system really that's worth building, you're building it for the purpose of achieving a mission. So you can't talk about the system without talking about the mission. You can't talk about the mission without talking about the system. Next chart. So we're going to have to talk about a sort of brief history of strategic bombardment to talk about ICBMs. And I usually start this somewhere out around the um, first industrial revolution and the, uh, you know, the uh, Evans flour mill. But I'll give you a break and I'll just start with World War I. This is actually this is a real photo of a British pilot in World War I with a serious piece of armor in it that is, you know, the heavy side down, the fins here, so it goes down. That little propeller will fuse it, and then when it strikes, it'll blow up. So it's a serious piece of armament, although it really looks pretty comical for what we do nowadays. And they really never got anywhere with strategic bombardment in World War I, but this is an important uh, photo for reasons you'll see in subsequent charts. Next chart. This is um, sort of a general view of what happened just before World War II, during World War II and right afterwards, and uh, builds on this whole idea of strategic bombardment. And so I'm going to throw out a few things here that we'll need to know later. First of all, this is a B-24, you can tell by the letter here. The, the most prolific bomber of World War II was B-24, they actually built them here as I recall here field. Not all of them, but some of them. My dad was a bolter gunner, a little tiny bolter, he was probably about that tall. And uh, they were part of the World War II Allied, Allied Combined Bomber Offensive. And the idea was, well, I'll get to the idea later. Um, let's go to the next chart. This is, uh, I lied, we're not going to start World War I, we're going to start with the Civil War. This is uh, Phineas Lowe was, Professor Phineas Lowe was a colonel in the Union Army and he went around with these balloons that were filled up with hydrogen, which he generated on site, carried, uh, the equipment was carried on buckboards, and he put these balloons up in the air and the main thing they did was reconnaissance to see behind the enemy lines, it's important, enemy lines, it's important, that'll come up later. Um, and uh, he, uh, there were other things too besides reconnaissance. In fact, he's credited with saving the entire general's army because of his reconnaissance. These things are filled with sulfuric acid and he'd throw um, iron filings in it to generate the hydrogen to lift up the balloon. If you ever get a chance to really study this, uh, Professor Lowe is an amazing, interesting guy. He married uh, an actress from Paris. And at some point in the Civil War, when he was trapped behind enemy lines, his wife dressed up as, a, as an old hag and drove a buckboard back behind enemy lines to go rescue him. So he's had a very colorful career. But eventually he was actually um, fired and sent home because, uh, well, uh, some people say because the generals just weren't ready yet for the rewards of having aviation and understanding how you can get the recon that you need using these balloons. Next chart. World War I. Uh, the thing that all of us remember from history class of World War I is that the front lines got fixed. You know, in the Civil War, the front lines were moving around. If you had time to go launch a balloon, look behind the front lines. World War I, they were pretty well fixed when uh, they got frozen. And uh, the whole idea of industrial warfare which started with the American Civil War in trains and Gatling guns and and rifled armament, things like that, really came to perfection in World War I, and they built huge, massive human slaughtering machines, and, and the front lines froze. And they had aviation, too, and the aviation was used, again, for reconnaissance of some dogfights, and a lot of times they were used to take down the enemy's reconnaissance balloons. But they never got into a serious use of aircraft in an offensive manner. So next chart gets to that, which is, uh, this, you know, don't know who this is, General Curtis Lemay. Okay, so in between World War I and World War II, 
we had the aviation, uh, the single, the aviation division of the Army Single Corps looked at what happened in the Civil War, looked at what happened in World War I and said, we have got a really great uh, technology here in aviation and we're wasting it, we're not using it the way we should in warfare. What we need to do is to take a hint from um, On War by uh, Clausewitz and understand that the enemy has a center of gravity that we're trying to push against. In a modern industrial warfare, a center of gravity that we need to attack is far behind his enemy lines, it's his industrial base. If we can take out his industrial base with our strategic bombers, we can, we can win this war. And so that's been the basic concept of aerial warfare since then, is the ability to strike at the enemy's center of uh, gravity, which is usually his industrial base. Now, uh, General LeMay started in World War II as Major LeMay, in charge of a group of aircraft, 72 aircraft, 96 men. And he went overseas with his group, and he was charged with taking this theory of strategic bombardment and making it work. As he arrived in Europe, one of the outgoing commanders took him aside and said, look, uh, you know, this is never going to work, because if you fly straight and level enough to hit the target, they're just going to wipe you out in the sky. They've got so much massive artillery that there's no way you're going to get through. So the best strategy you would have is to figure out ways to save yourself from getting killed. Uh, General LeMay did not, was not the sort of guy who would look at it that way. He's, his philosophy was when you kill enough of them, they stop fighting. And if I can kill them fast enough, I will actually save lives because I'll stop this war quickly. And so that was General LeMay's philosophy. And what he did the first few nights he was in theater with his men, he did his regular job during the day. And at night, he pondered what this outgoing commander had said, actually ran quite a few numbers trying to figure out the probabilities of, of kill at various altitudes and weapons. And he told his men, look, we're going in. We're going to fly high. We're going to fly straight and level. We're going to take out the target. You're flying with me, some of you are going to get killed, but we're going to get killed fulfilling the mission. We're going to take out the targets. And so he was really credited, uh, rightly so, with really seeing the vision of that doctrine and making it work. I mean, there were other commanders, but he is the epitome of making that strategic bombing activity work. And uh, I have a couple of photos here that I wanted to mention in passing. This is the Schweinfurt uh, ball bearing plant. So if you're going to attack industry and try to take down German industry, what do you attack? Well, that was a big question for the planners. And a lot of the things that they looked at were oil refineries, uh, railroad crossings, intersections, uh, gathering, what do you call those, rail switchways for railroads. And they figured out that Germany had a huge amount of its ball bearing production all in one spot in Schweinfurt, and that became a prime target. And they went after it with this, uh, you know, these groups of uh, aircraft. Um, it was extremely well protected, and they lost many, many men and many, many aircraft, and they almost gave up on the idea of strategic bombardment with that single mission alone. The other thing I want to mention about aircraft and strategic bombardment is Caserta, which was during the Spanish Civil War, between World War I and World War II, where the uh, Germans actually tried out a lot of their aerial bombardment techniques. And this is the Picasso painting or drawing of the horrible carnage that occurred in Gersinia. And I mention that because they were going after civilian populations. They were trying to take out cities. They weren't basically trying to stop a war or win a war by defeating the country's industry. They were simply trying to uh, create a huge amount of mayhem in the hopes that they would demoralize the country. And generally speaking, that doesn't really work. And it's not something that the US does, for sure. Next chart. So what we learned coming out of World War II is that um, now General LeMay was very successful in Europe and we basically got to the point where we won the war in Europe. They sent him out to the Pacific where he was in charge of B-29s, bigger, heavier bombers. And uh, he again flew with his men all the time up until the point 
where they told him the secret of the A-bomb, and then they told him, you can't fly with your men anymore, you know too much. But shortly after that, um, we actually dropped the A-bombs and the war was over. He led uh, similar missions against the Japanese as he led in Germany. Unfortunately for the Japanese, their industry was located in the middle of their cities, which were constructed in wood. So when he carried out the same tactics, he could fly a mission at uh, 8,000 feet, precisely deliver his bombs to take out the industry and wind up killing 100,000 people in the city of Tokyo in one night. Horrible carnage. But he kept with this idea that um, if, you, if you hit them hard enough, fast enough, and kill enough people early on, you end the war sooner. And basically, that reached its ultimate in the uh, dropping of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So Hiroshima, I think, was 80,000 people in the first night, and then another 80,000 died from radiation later. Um, horrible carnage, but delivered by one aircraft and one bomb. Whereas this was a whole campaign of B-29s in the whole group, or even a wing. So at the end of World War II, the people in charge of the defense of the United States look back and they go, yeah, you know, we pretty much proved this idea of strategic bombardment. Not only that, we proved it too good. We proved that any country with enough industrial capability can mount a campaign, cross a major ocean, and strike another country and do deadly damage. In fact, you don't even have to raise a whole wing or group of aircraft anymore, you just have to get one or two aircraft through with, with an atomic bomb. The oceans are no longer protection for us here in the United States. And for the people that didn't necessarily believe that right away, when the Soviets flew their Sputnik over in 1957, everybody was thinking, well, they could put a bomb on them. And then shortly after that, of course, they flew the first animal in orbit, then they flew the first man in orbit, and then they flew the first woman in orbit. They were way ahead of us. People were very nervous, very concerned. How can we protect the United States? The old rules no longer apply. Next chart. To the idea behind uh, the mission of the ICBM, see we got there eventually, uh, is that, uh, well, we can't really set up a situation here militarily where we preemptively defeat an enemy who might be thinking about going after us. That's, that's for many reasons, including that's not morally right. We can't really defend against bombardment from the sky. So what strategy can we use? Well, the, the solution was to deter, to set up enough uh, capability in our own country that no country with the capability to attack us would because the amount of punishment they would endure would not make it would make it very much not worth their while. So that's the mission of deterrence. Um, and uh, ICBMs is part of that mission. Next chart. So it's a part of that mission because there's also sea launch ballistic missiles and manned bombers as part of this triad that keeps the enemy, any enemy capable of attacking the United States, deciding they're not going to attack them because they are definitely going to uh, uh, take us out if we try. So, first of all, sea launch ballistic missiles. They're in submarines. They can launch. Uh, they can be very stealthy. Nobody can find them. And uh, so they're sort of uh, the backup to the backup to the backup. If somebody were to think that they could possibly take out all of our ICBMs and all of our manned bombers, we know they're not going to take out the sea launch ballistic missiles because they can't even find them. So that's the ultimate deterrence. The man bombers are flexible and they're capable of sending a message. If we're starting to get concerned and nervous about something that's going on in the world, we can start to alert our bombers. The enemy can see what we're doing, they can see where we're positioning them, and they can see that we're serious about being concerned about what they're up to. So they're able to send a message, but they're also flexible in the amount of damage that they can deliver to another country. ICBMs, on the other hand, they're buried in silos across the northern tier of the United States. They're extremely responsive. They're on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they can be deployed before, during, or after a nuclear attack by another country. They're well enough protected 
that no country can uh, believe that they could ever take out all of the ICBMs. So that's, that's the triad, that's the deterrence. Some people nowadays like to say, well, missile defense, it's, it's now four items in the triad. Um, missile defense that we have currently is located in Fort Greeley <coughs> at Mandenberg. And you guys probably saw the big white trucks guarding the barbed wire enclosures. So from either Vandenberg or Fort Greeley, we can take out um, an intercontinental ballistic missile if one or two get fired by, say, North Korea. But we certainly don't have enough in our field of missiles and probably never will that could actually counter a Russian attack, for instance. So I don't really see missile defense as being part of this calculus of deterrence. The other thing I'm going to say about deterrence is um, I gave you just extremely high-level explanation of it. Uh, books and volumes and, uh, of material have been written by, by experts on deterrence and how, what's the right number of the different pieces to make it work so that the enemy doesn't feel like uh, they have any chance of winning if they were to attack. So basically, deterrence protects us against the existential threat to our nation. Next chart. <clears throat> At this point, I want to mention that, yeah, there's Minuteman 3 out there. It was deployed in the early 1970s. It's the only ICBM we've got deployed right now. There were many that were built and created over time. Um, and there's a systems engineering story behind that. I gave a presentation here, I think it was last February, where I brought my book that described the Bell Lab systems engineering uh, activities. Did I loan that to somebody here, by the way? I couldn't find it to bring it in tonight. Well, anyway, anybody has my book, return it, please. I took a picture of the cover page, but I didn't take the book. <laughs> Gotta find it. Anyway, Bell, you all know, being systems engineers, <coughs> Bell Labs invented systems engineering. And uh, as the systems became more and more complex over the years, uh, you just really had to have somebody come up with this concept of how you get your arms around all of these requirements. Well, in, uh, in the early, early days of ICBMs, like before they were ever even built at all, uh, there was a fellow named uh, uh, Simon Ramo and um, Woolridge. What was Woolridge's first name? I don't know, it's in the notes, I can't see it. Ramo uh, and Woolridge uh, helped the Air Force to come up with their first uh, steps towards ICBMs. And the Air Force really liked that a lot, so they wanted to uh, get them to do more and more systems engineering activity in order to create ICBMs. So Ramo Woolridge joined with a car company called Thompson Products, created a company called TRW, which um, provided the systems engineering for ICBMs. And so, and you see something in parallel happening on the Navy side with sea launch ballistic missiles. They had a lot more of their systems engineers are actually naval officers, but in the Air Force it was TRW. And so you see the Bell Labs theory and practice start to get perfected in the creation of these ICBMs. And then something else interesting, and I mentioned this last February, something interesting happened in 1985 where we started applying systems engineering to the problem of sustainment and keeping these systems going for decades at a time. Next chart. So, <clears throat> ballistic missiles, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So, I will talk about uh, what those words mean starting with ballistic. Uh, of course, everybody has played with the ball and figured out that if you throw it at a certain angle, you can get the, the furthest distance for the amount of energy you put into it. If you throw it too high, it doesn't go as far. If you throw it too long, it doesn't go as far. Parabolic trajectories. Next chart. There we go. So this is the way I explain ballistic missiles to uh, everybody. If you can aim that ball towards that hoop and get it going just the right amount of velocity as it leaves your hand in the right direction at the right angle, as with an elevation, <coughs> it'll go through that hoop every time. And that's basically what an ICBM does. The downstage, the booster, tosses the post-boost vehicle at just the right speed, at just the right angle to 
hit that target on the other side of the earth. So the next chart, uh, and this is the, uh, where I'm going to say downstage, I mean stage one, two, and three, that's the downstage. Next chart. <clears throat> so this is all just stuff I got from Wikipedia asking it to give me generic information about ICBMs. They tend to go through the boost phase in about three to five minutes. They burn out at about two and a half to five miles per second, so that's the velocity you're trying to get, trying to get it in the right direction. We'll talk about that later. And usually that occurs about 100 to 250 miles up. <clears throat> and then you're in the mid-course, where you're suborbital at about 750 to 4,000 miles. And then there's a reentry phase where the warhead has to survive coming back through the atmosphere in order to be effective against the target. ICBMs are generally in a range of about 8,000 miles, and an Earth's circumference of about 25,000 miles. You think, well, is that enough? Well, that's about 5,500 miles from this point to this point, so yeah, that's enough. Um, I do have that video. Do you want to try to give that, give that video a try? See how much of an interruption that would be to this? Uh, go to two and a half minutes. So this is a video that you can find on my website. Um, and you can see the door being blasted open and the missile going up. And after stage one, two, and three, go to three and a half minutes. Now. After stage one, two, and three, Getting through that, you're getting through that and you're, you're boosting the vehicle uh, in a ballistic trajectory. So we're up at 45 seconds, roll maneuver, you get your guidance system aligned to the right place. Stage one separation. And this video is available on my website. Stage one, two, skirt separation. And we're getting rid of the shroud, blasting it away. Getting rid of stage two. Stage three, we'll go into a thrust termination here in a second. And now you drop off the reentry vehicle. That was what I was mentioning earlier where you, see I, I uh, I stretch the point a bit to say that you've got the perfect velocity when you let go of the post-boost vehicle. The uh, cheat we have is we've got a little post-boost um, PSRE engine that lets you tweak it a little bit. It just at the perfect speed and the perfect attitude before releasing the reentry vehicle and backing away. And then the reentry vehicle will spin up to preserve itself going through the atmosphere. Yeah, let's go back to the charts. This is about a, you can find versions of this. This version is five minutes. I think there's another version that's about 10 minutes. But uh, you can watch this at home. So the next chart. So taking all of that information from Wikipedia and laying it out against a picture of the Earth. So this is our home planet with a radius of about 4,000 miles. This is the International Space Station that seems so far above the Earth, but it's actually skimming along at 200 miles above. This is geosynchronous out at 22,000. If you put a, a satellite out here, it will orbit at just the same speed as the Earth rotates. So that's a popular um, orbit to be in. But a lot of the commercial space occurs right here nearby. The ICBM, as it launches, will be up in this area because it's a parabolic arc, just like throwing a ball um, and to, to hit the other side of the Earth. Next chart. Um, a lot of, and a lot of times still in movies and TV, you see incoming um, ICBMs being described as having you know, all the pieces and parts like a V2. Now you saw in that video, the only thing that's coming in is the warhead. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention besides this missile is that uh, a huge part of the weapon system, of course, is more than just the missile. It's the place you launch it from. 
It's also the launch control facility here that uh, controls that launch. Next chart. So we'll talk about the missile really quick. Next chart. Stage one. In Minuteman one, or Minuteman three, which is the only ICBM that's out there right now, it was deployed in 1972. Uh, this stage one was designed and built, created by our friends out at Orbital ATK, who back then was Firefall. And I had the wonderful opportunity to meet and chat with the team that created the stage one back in 2010. They were in their 80s, mid 80s at that point. They were in their mid 20s when they designed it. They were hired out of college by Thiokol and sat down at a table like these guys over here. There were four of them. The boss comes in and says, I need you to build a stage one that will have this much energy and will launch out of a silo and not destroy itself in the process. And they told the story of, you know, remembered very clearly that day, they turned to their boss and said, how do we do that? And their boss said, that's why I hired you, figure out how to do that. So they said they spent a lot of time out in the deserts there in northern Utah, firing these things on their side, and then go and looking for the nozzles that got blown across the desert until eventually they got it right. And this is what they came up with. They've got four nozzles at the aft end, They've got the solid rocket motor fuel in there. And the thing about solid rocket uh, fuel is that it carries the oxidizer in with the fuel, but it's going to only burn on the edge of the fuel. If all the fuel burned all at once, it would just blow up. It's got to be a controlled burn. And so they put a star shape in there so that as it burned, the surface area would be about the same and they get about equal thrust all the way through the burn. And they put these nozzles at the back so that they could control the nozzles to give them roll, pitch, and yaw. Because remember, as soon as, it, as soon as it comes out of the silo, it's got to pitch over and roll. Next chart. So this is the uh, flight control for stage one. It's got a hydraulic pump. It's got hydraulics. And it basically <coughs> pushes with these servos out these arms, pushes those um, nozzles back and forth in order to get roll pitch and yaw. Uh, next chart. Stage two um, has a, uh, a yaw and pitch provided by these liquid injection devices that, that push liquid into the plume in order to give it the uh, yaw and the pitch. So it has to have a special roll control valve here to give it roll control. And it's a little bit you know, smaller, but basically the same. And it's got a igniter here to start that fuel, and it's got a similar star shape. Next chart. Uh, stage three, smaller still, same thing, solid fuel. The thing that, uh, and, and it's got a roll control system on the side, only one. Uh, the thing about the solid rocket fuel is it's perfect for ICBMs <coughs> because you can set these uh, missiles into a silo and leave them in the silo for years and years and years and not worry about whether uh, the missile will work or not. A solid rocket fuel will last for um, one, two decades. There's a whole uh, assessment system around making sure that when you turn the key, the rocket will fire. But also the thing about solid rocket fuel is you can't shut it off because the out fuel and the oxidizers is, is all in there all together. Once you start to burn that uh, fuel and oxidizer mix um, in this uh, basically combustion chamber, the heat and the pressure is going to keep it burning. So how do you get the perfect velocity when that basketball player is letting go of the basketball or you're trying to let loose in that post boost vehicle at just the right speed? Well, you've got to figure out a way to shut off the third stage. And the way they do that is with these thrust termination ports, which you saw in the video, by the way, just before it backed away from that reentry vehicle. You saw these ports blow out. Um, so, next chart. Guidance system. Now we're into the post boost vehicle. Um, the PSRE you saw there, 
firing, changing the attitude, giving some axial thrust. Uh, the PSRE is a classic, classic design. It's been used forever. You, know, you basically take monomethyl hydrazine, combine it with dinitrogen hydroxide, and you have a hypergolic bipropellant rocket engine, which basically means all you have to do is squirt out a little fuel and oxidizer into the engine and it immediately ignites. Very simple, and that's why they used it on the space shuttle. They still use it now on SpaceX. Anytime anybody's trying to come up with an attitude control system, the design engineer asks himself the question, why don't I just use this? It works great. And if he doesn't have a negative answer to that, he just uses this kind of a system. Um, Charlie, that was the failure on the heavy why they didn't recover the core stages. They didn't have enough uh, hydrazine left to reignite the booster for landing on the barge. Interesting. Yeah, so in, in all these things I'm talking about, for instance, when I was talking about the, uh, the controlling the plume of the second stage and the third stage with injecting, there are certain conditions under which you might run out of injecting and no longer have control of your missile. So you have to think through all of these things to make sure that you don't wind up in that position. And sometimes all of the analysis you do on the computer and back at your desk it's overridden by reality and you actually run out when you didn't think you would. Uh, next chart, we'll talk about the guidance system. There's actually uh, the original guidance system, the NS-20 on Minuteman 3, and now there's the new NS-50 guidance system. The NS-20 was deployed with the Minuteman 3 back in the early 70s. Basically, um, uh, Apollo era uh, guidance system. Uh, and this is what, back in the day, they would call a microcomputer. It's about this big. And it's got 33 cards in it. And on most of those cards, it's populated with integrated circuits about th that big that have a, a few NAND gates on them. And back in 1986, I got the assignment at TRW to be the TRW D37 expert. So I started pulling out all these drawings and figuring out where all this stuff is. And of course, my background is in more of the, at that point in time, uh, more of the 1980s. You know, I could program a Z80 chip on a TRS-80, you know. It's, and, and the light really came on after looking through a few of these drawings and a few of these logic charts and a few of these wiring diagrams. And I go, oh, all of these cards are what we have in a little chip in a TSR-80 now. It's all basically... Uh, so now where's the memory? The memory is a spinning, rotating disk on the side. But the cute thing about that disk is all the read and write heads are welded or soldered in place. So the software had to be written so that you knew when that uh, information was crossing, when the loop on that disk was crossing over either the read or write head, and you could either write or pull the information out. And so that's really, uh, I think it was about 4K of memory, and you're able to precisely hit a target on the other side of the earth with that computer. Um, this is the missile guidance set control. So this, these electronics combined with these gyroscopes is what nowadays we would call an inertial measurement unit. Basically, within um, an inertial guidance unit electronics. But the fundamental design remained the same. You had a, uh, computer, you have the uh, controller electronics for the gyroscopes, and you have the um, amplifier for the downstage controls. So the next chart shows you a little bit about the gyroscopes. Now just go ahead and skip that one. So inside this stable platform housing, you have this hunk of metal, which is a stable platform, and the whole idea is as the missile flies, this platform remains fixed in inertial space no matter what the missile is doing. And you want it fixed in inertial space to make it easy on the computer to calculate the information that these velocity meters basically are picking up. These are pendulous integrating gyroscopic accelerometers. And you all know, you play with gyroscopes, you know that if you hang a weight off the end of a gyroscope, it's going to persist. Well, it turns out that that precession 
uh, if you count the number of times it processes, that's proportional to the amount of acceleration that it's actually the, the amount of acceleration gets integrated and it's proportional to the velocity of the device that you've got there. So this measures the velocity of the missile and it allows you to know when to fire those uh, ports on the stage three and get just the right velocity as, as you throw that basketball. Now keeping these lined up down, down, down the nose of the uh, missile so that it measures uh, the speed as precisely as it can, you've got gyroscopes back here that report on whether the platform is stable and how much you have to tweak it to keep it stable. So uh, gyroscopes do that. This is completely useless when you're flying the ICBM. That's your um, um, gyro compass. So when you're in the silo, this gyro compass is telling the computer and everybody else which way is north, which way to the target. And when you go launch, you don't need that anymore. Now the computer knows where it's going, and it just keeps the platform stable. Now the interesting thing about these pigs is, this is a design that goes all the way back to that V2 rocket I showed you. The uh, V2 rocket had a piga in it, a single piga, and all it did was it would precess, the gyro would precess, and at a certain point, that precession would shut off the fuel valve and shut off the fuel to the V2 at just the right speed so that it would hit downtown London. The Draper innovation was to make that 10,000 times more precise, make it into a velocity linear. Next chart. And that's the business end of the ICP. It's the reentry system. And the Minuteman 3 can hold one, two, or three reentry vehicles with the bombs inside. Next chart addresses the question of you have a lot of things going on in this missile. Uh, you've got stages firing, you've got stages disconnecting. You're not moving ahead. Oh, no? Yeah, that's right. So how are you controlling all that? Well, all through the missile, you've got these pyrotechnic devices that are uh, uh, triggering gas generators to allow for roll control. You have devices at the top of each of stage one, two, and three that are igniters, and you've got pyrotechnics that trigger that to fire the engine. And all of these are connected in with safe and arm devices and other safety devices to make sure they only trigger when you need them to trigger. So I once created a drawing of a Minuteman ICBM sitting in the silo where I identified every single bit of pyrotechnics and safe and arm devices. They were like a hundred arrows pointing in from, you know, with labels. It was really a high chart. Nice chart. Oh, by the way, go back. Uh, you know what was, you know what's going on here, right? It's a static fire. And they're measuring the uh, thrust produced. It's just immediately after ignition. So I'm going to let kind of looks like, uh, I think that's what, uh, ATK, right? Wrong yep. tour? At March 29th, there's a Peacekeeper first stage static test at 1 o'clock if anyone wants to drive out to the public viewing area and cool. watch it cool. It's a very energetic yeah. test. It's very cool. It is. <coughs> Depending on how close you can get, very, very loud. You're about a mile, but you'll feel it. The ground will shake, you'll feel it in your clothes. You can grunt. Sometimes they get out there for a static test and there'll be cloud cover and just sort of amplifies the sound. Yeah, they don't let us. We blew out some windows in Salt Lake like 15 years ago, and now they don't let us test fire on cloud cover days anymore. Oh, really? <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Yeah. So it's March 29th? March 29th at 1 o'clock. Uh, next chart. So, um, you know, a very quick and dirty explanation of the missile, and I mentioned that the missile really isn't uh, uh, that useful unless you've got a silo to put it in and protect it. Uh, the missile is actually hanging on cables. This is steel and concrete. Um, these launch facilities and the launch control facilities can withstand nuclear attacks. This is about a 100 ton lid on top of this silo. And again, you use pyrotechnics and, and ballistic gas generators to blow this lid across, and you saw that in the video. Um, 
And of course, there's a lot of equipment in here that has to be protected against nuclear blasts too. And there's a lot of uh, power requirements that you have to make sure are fulfilled, even if there is no power grid left. Uh, next chart. And this is a launch control facility. So a lot of times, again, you know, I mentioned in movies and TVs, you'll see these very unrealistic depictions of ICBMs, like the entire rocket is coming in for a target. Or there was one in the X-Files where Mulder and Scully were running down tunnels that connected all the ICBM sites. That stuff is not true. But the movie where people go out to a farmhouse and then go to the next chart. So this is uh, an example of a missile field in uh, North Dakota. This is Minot, North Dakota. Um, and these are all of the missiles you can see spread out over hundreds and hundreds of miles. So that if uh, a country did feel like it had to take out our ICBMs, uh, they would have to put forth a huge effort just to take out one launch facility, and then they would have to try to take out all these others too. Um, I always like to tell the story about the uh, commander at um, Hickam Field who got in trouble for putting all the aircraft all in one spot uh, just before December 7th, 1941, because he was concerned about sabotage. And never in his wildest dreams did he imagine that he'd have a shot from the air taking out all those aircraft. That was before strategic bombardment had been perfected. Next chart talks about the fact that, uh, oh, that's right, these are in a different order. Um, okay, so these are all of the active ICBM sites in the nation today, Montana, North Dakota, and the area around Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska, F.E. Warren Air Force Base near Cheyenne. So you see the missile fields are all roughly the same size. But you also notice there's three other missile fields. These are Minuteman ICBM missile fields now. They're gone. They've been retired. And there are other missile fields from previous ICBMs that are all gone and retired. In fact, over the years, starting in the mid-60s, we have been working diligently to try to get rid of nuclear weapons because they're nasty, dirty, awful things. And over the years, we've been very successful. And uh, what we should look for in the future is trying to be even more successful with nuclear weapons or trying to find a different weapon system we can use for deterrence. Next chart. This is a picture of um, the missile construction facility at Vandenberg Air Force Base. But there's similar facilities out at Hill Air Force Base where you can put the whole downstage together and check it out. <clears throat> so this sort of illustrates the fact that there's more to it than the missile. There's more to it than the missile and launch facility and the control, launch control center. There's all of these other things that have to work and work well for this weapon system to be a useful deterrent. We've got a lot of ground support equipment. We've got a lot of uh, repair depots that have their own support equipment. Uh, there's communications, command and control. Trainers is an interesting one. I, I find it interesting because I started an ICBM on trainers. Uh, as a matter of fact, my first assignment, TRW, was I was the um, engineer for the trainer for the sump pump at the bottom of the silo. So I like to tell people I started at the very bottom, not even the sump pump, but the sump pump trainer. But the concept early on was we're going to have 18, 19 year olds repairing and providing maintenance on these nuclear weapons. Maybe the first time that they're practicing with this, we should have them do it on trainers instead of the real thing. So that's a big part of what's going on. A lot of databases, a lot of important information, especially assessment type information, ah, telling you how the system is doing. <laughs> Documentation, processes, people. That's a whole other presentation just for the things that are listed on this chart. Next chart. <clears throat> so, getting towards the end, why do ICBMs keep working as well as they do? And when are they going to be needing a uh, replacement? Because I keep mentioning that this one, the only one that's out there now, it's been there since the early 70s. Next chart. This is what I go around talking at a lot of different conferences and making presentations on. The sustainment model that helps you 
to keep something as complex as an ICBM working for five decades. Observe the readiness, identify sustainment risks, and fix the system. Um, again, this could be like a two-hour presentation on just this one chart. If you want to read more about how we do sustainment in ICBMs or other complex systems, you can read about it at my website. But I gave a presentation at the Great Lakes uh, Regional Conference, which was uh, really well attended. I had maybe 30, 40 people there, and not a single person from Department of Defense. It was John Deere tractor, train air conditioners, medical equipment. All these people who nowadays are finding that they need to use systems engineering for their own massive nationwide complex systems are now being presented with the problem of how do I keep these things working for decades? And so they were interested to see how we did it in ICBMs. Next chart. When will it need replaced? Some of you guys have already moved over to, do, to work on sustaining ICBMs or coming up with the next one. The GPST is expected to be hitting production from in the late 2020s and be online from 2027 to 2075 at least. That's the latest fit biz ops I've seen. It might be different by now, but generally about that time frame. And so Miniman 3 is going to have to be out there until past 2027. These are the other ICBMs I mentioned earlier that have all been retired. The ones that, uh, I think I've got them all up there. How are we doing for time? I feel like I've been in time. So I've got 45, so you got 15 minutes. Okay. So um, let's just go ahead and go to the next chart and go to Q&A at this point because I am getting tired of talking. Does anybody have any questions or any of the other earlier charts that you'd like me to talk more about or pieces of the weapon system? One of my favorite topics, uh, let's go back two charts to that sustainment, you know, this thing. Observe readiness, identify risk, fix system. One of the more, most important things you do when applying this model is drawing a line around your entire weapon system. And one of the most critical pieces of your weapon system is the one I listed towards the end on the previous chart, which is people. And I think you, a lot of you folks saw that the, uh, the articles and information about uh, the people who were uh, part of the combat crew, the key turners, the lieutenants who were getting pretty fed up with their lot in life and the Air Force had to take a great deal of effort to improve their morale. We did not apply this activity to the people. We made decisions on upgrading um, software and hardware and facilities based upon will the hardware work. And so we wound up with a lot of people working in a lot of crappy facilities a lot of crappy equipment, being really upset and frustrated, and they were left out of this loop, and they turned out to be, at least a few years ago, the weakest link in the system. So this has got, you've got to draw a line around your entire system, which includes people, in order to make sure that you're assessing and fixing things as you go. I will, if there are no questions, okay. So you had a chart earlier that showed the nuclear triad and a question mark by missile defense. Uh -huh. And um, I, one of my favorite. To to that? No, you. Know, sorry, I'm just okay. giving you some context. One of my favorite websites is The Verge. Mm -hmm. um, there's an article this week inside the race for hypersonic weapons. A speech by Putin heats up the new global arms race for hypersonic. So it's been a lob in the basketball. I'm just gonna throw it straight at you. How do you see hypersonics affecting kind of this nuclear triad strategy? Yeah, there's, I could think of about three or four directions to go here. The first thing I'll say is, back in the day when we were coming up with nuclear-powered bombers, and yes, we did experiment with nuclear-powered bombers, the Soviets actually flew, I think, 30 or 40 missions with the reactor on board, um, and in a few of the missions, they fired up the reactor, and the problem, of course, was the shielding. You probably killed a crew trying to operate a bomber with an onboard nuclear reactor, but 
there were designs that would make that work. Another design in the same era, and we're talking like 50s and 60s, was a ramjet ICBM that was designed to use uh, power from a nuclear um, reaction to uh, create a ramjet effect through the engine. And so it could do exactly what uh, Putin is talking about. This is a design that was from the 50s and 60s. It will also lead a trail of radioactivity all the way from your homeland across Canada and into, you very quickly thought, you know, it's probably not a design we want to build. Um, so I'm thinking that that particular design that Putin is talking about is just something he's throwing out there for diplomatic reasons, not something he ever had the craziness to actually build and deploy. But the other thing I might mention is that you know, I had the chart showing all the salt talks and the fact that ICBMs is the only one we've got now. Well, China and Russia didn't stop building and creating new ICBMs when we stopped. And they, their stuff is much newer than ours. And so the, I think the appropriate response, which is you know, started back in President Obama's uh, administration, is to realize we're at the point where we need a GBSD. We need to replace them. We don't have any better ideas for anything better than an ICBM to provide deterrence. So we need to go ahead and, and you know, put some money into building a new missile and probably using a lot of the same ground systems and control systems we have now from Minuteman. It's going to create a huge furor because you know the people in America who pay for all this stuff, they don't know that China and Russia has been building new stuff for decades while we've just been keeping the old stuff working. So, short answer, what was the question, what should we do about it? No, the question was, do you see hypersonics becoming a fourth leg? Oh, okay, yeah, so we, and we've been experimenting with hypersonics. That's correct. Yes. Um, yeah. And um, so, uh, I haven't mentioned it all, I haven't mentioned at all cruise missiles here. I haven't mentioned at all tactical nuclear weapons. And that's a whole another area of uh, strategic uh, nuclear weapons. And the question, at least the question I always ask myself when looking at these new weapons is, when you deploy this weapon, are you creating a safer world or more dangerous world? So let's look at uh, the Peacekeeper weapon system, for instance. Peacekeeper was developed as the next ICBM after Minuteman III, and you could put 10 warheads on top of it. And that made it a very lucrative target, something that, that the Soviets were very much want to take out, but not to worry, we were going to put it on railway cars and hide it so they wouldn't know where to attack, right? But we never could pull that off, so we wound up putting it into Minuteman silos. Now you've done just the opposite of what you want to do. You've created an extremely lucrative target and almost daring the Russians to say, look, uh, you know, great target right here, why don't you try to take it out first? You don't want that sort of thing in the calculus of deterrence. What you want is all of your weapons spread out and convincing the enemy that uh, any sort of attack will fail and they'll suffer worse than you will. So the question on hypersonics is, what is the weapon exactly? What mission is it fulfilling? And is it going to increase our ability to have deterrence? Or is it going to make the world a less stable place? And it's got the ability to go either way, depending on what you build. Yeah. If I can yeah. add into that a little bit, the X-45 is one of those type of devices. Uh, since we've got somebody in the materials world, that's one of the problems they run into. When you start getting into those kind of speeds, the, the skin can't handle it. <clears throat> so for instance, on the space plane, what they were looking at doing was trying to figure out how to run the fuel up against the skin to cool it down. Uh, the other aspect is, is when you get up into those kind of speeds, the electronics were never designed to be at those speeds. So they self-destruct. So they've got, they, get, they get a snapshot of when it self-destruct, and they take that back to design more, then bring it back and do that. It's extremely expensive to launch those things. So over time, so we we know a lot about those sorts of environments from the few seconds that we have reentry vehicles trying to penetrate the atmosphere. But 
like I say, that's a few seconds that you're talking about. Those, are, skip, those are usually skipping yeah. in the atmosphere and not under controlled flight. Yeah, the uh, hypersonics. Yeah. yeah, right. And they're having to deal with the stresses for much longer times. How about communications? How do they communicate um, through all that? Those are really hard because antennas tend to burn off. Yeah. Uh, or e even that, <laughs> when they get up to that speed, the heat that's put off by the ionization, skin, ionization yeah. blanks it out of the water. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned about <clears throat> the fact of the DMS issues associated with the early models. The shuttle was looked at uh, trying to continue the program, but it was because of the electronics that it had and the cost to refit those, they decided it was better to do away with the program. When, when they found out later on, it was more cost effective to actually probably have done the electronics so that they continue using the shuttle. Could we talk about the threat from North Korea and what yeah. they've been developing? Yeah, so if you go back to that slide that had the triad on it, uh, I've got a map of our ground base fleet course defense. So the threat from North Korea, the, at least the one that's in the news all the time, is we, we North Korea, can fire an intercontinental ballistic missile that can hit your country. And just based upon pure physics, yeah, they probably could hit California by now, and Definitely. Alaska. as they make progress, they go further and further in. The question is, could they actually duplicate our technology of a reentry vehicle with a atomic bomb in it that would do a lot of damage? And um, and eventually they will. I mean, we, it took us a while during the 50s and 60s to develop the technology, and eventually they will too. Um, what we have is these missile fields at Vandenberg. Well, we have a few missile emplacements at Vandenberg. We have missile fields at Fort Greeley, which is right around in here, that can, um, and then we have radars all over, like the sea-based X-band radar. And Navy ships, too. And Navy ships. Yeah. That can detect in mid-course and launch and try to hit a bullet with a bullet. Now, I personally think that that technology is there and will work. It's a question of how many rockets do you have to fire to take out that single warhead. Other people are much more skeptical and say, you know, your, your, your probability of success at hitting that is much lower than you think, Charlie. But there, there's a public debate over that because all of the important information is secret. And you could actually figure that out. But, or so all you're doing is you're looking at all the tests and trying yeah. to figure out how many hits and how many misses. How many hits how many misses and, and how good are we at it nowadays. And I think that for the missiles that they have today, uh, we have enough missiles in the missile field that we could keep them from impacting on us. Um, we also have uh, Navy protection for intermediate range type missiles that don't go as high and as fast. Um, and so all of that missile defense activity continues on and gets better every day. But um, the military is war plans to figure out what to do to North Korea if they ever were to launch an attack like that. I mean, it, it's, it would be uh, the end of their country, basically, because the, we couldn't tolerate being struck in our country by their missiles. So I guess I'm curious, the one thing you haven't mentioned what? Airborne laser. Yes. Um, I worked with the program manager on that for a while, and I know that it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, about 15 years ago, it went completely off the radar, mm -hmm. um, which, subs which was about the same time that they finished their flight testing. Um, I mean, my personal thought would be, it'd be handy to have it flying out of Okinawa right about now. Well, it's interesting. You know, We've had um, Minuteman tests out of Manover, where they've been uh, cooperative tests with the ABL. Okay. Things like that going on that are very hush hush. Secret. Right. Right. Um, the again, the physics, the chemistry, it's there. I don't know how good it is today, but eventually it'll be good enough. Maybe it's I, good I enough today. It, from what I heard, it was it was very good in '98. And it was probably 20 years later, it's probably 
Well, to me, you just yeah. got a $25 million contract for laser deterrence, right? Yeah. So yeah. they're working it still. Yeah, so the issue, I don't think the issue is so much being enough power on board the aircraft. You can do that. Well, I think the issue have, is getting focus through the atmosphere. It's the, yeah, the, the so tracking it's control and the simulation system. and everything. So they've, they've got a lot of uh, ideas that they've developed and proven that show how they can they can send certain beams through the atmosphere to determine what's going on, to refocus the laser in real time. Based and, on the distance and everything, but yeah. And, and I'm, I'm a control systems engineer. So I know what control systems math we have. I know what kind of computers we have. We could just about do, I mean, we can we can land boosters, you know, aft and down with yeah. our control systems nowadays. Yeah. I think they, they can make the lasers work. I, I think we ought to build a large uh, system of lasers in downtown Salt Lake City with a focusing beam that goes up through the atmosphere. So when we get an inversion, we can blast a hole and get all that and stuff. Create set. a draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, it's it's in it. Uh, just, a don't, lot of, just don't have anybody fly over that. <laughs> <laughs> Details. Birdbath. <laughs> They'll disappear up a little bit. Um, it's really what you said. It's kind of like a, a walk down memory lane. For my dad actually worked at Raymond Woolrich before it was Jeremy and worked up here on the Minuteman and a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of fascinating because the stuff I grew up on, all this stuff as a kid, which is why I'm cursed as an engineer now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really fascinating to see all these things happen you know, and where we're at now. Um, it's kind of a, it's really an amazing thing. It was, but this was really fun. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I think I inherited my dad's love of technology. He got to ride along on the highest tech, you know, medium-sized bomber aircraft ever built, all metal. I don't think he enjoyed it so much, though. People were shooting at it. Um, my dad actually um, did the instrumentation for the V-2 launches in Alberta, and then he's helped set up at Vandenberg also back in the day. So, I mean, you know, I've got, he recently passed away, I've got pictures of all sorts of stuff. And it's like, oh my god. And you've got some of them up there, too. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. So, they're really interesting. So you, so you talked about why you think the Peacekeeper didn't work, why it wasn't a good idea. Well, it's a small missile. What was its downfall? Um, I think well, at least part of small missile's downfall was people just didn't want to spend any more on ICBMs and then that was working just fine. And remember that curve where we're trying to get rid of, you know, having these salt talks, trying to... Peacekeeper was a wonderful bargaining chip. He encounters really screwed things up. What was what the was, counters really screwed uh, things up? What was small missile? What was that? It, it was um, smaller than an ICBM. It could be carried on the back of a truck. If you go out to the Hill Aerospace Museum, uh, as you turn into the museum, and before you turn left again to go towards it, you look straight ahead behind the fence where you're not supposed to get into. There's this. Uh, it's called Hummel, I think it was called, which was the carrier for the uh, mm -hmm. small missile. And you drive around in a truck and then stop. And, and both the small missile and the peacekeeper, well, the peacekeeper especially, had the most precise inertial guidance system ever built. It's just, and that, there's, a, there's one of those in the museum. It, it was a ball about this big. It would, it would tumble. And inside that ball were the same things you saw on that stable platform. It had gyros and it had piggins, only they were called cipher. Um, which everybody said was the same frigging instrument revisited, only they said the same frigging. Um, and um, it, was, it would tumble, and then when it would get ready to launch, it would stop and in the right position, and then the missile would fly, and this ball would stay in the same position. And they did it with air jets. Amazing device. And when we first deployed Peacekeeper, they were, they were had a, like a, Mean time between failure of about 45 seconds. It was just really horrible in terms of uh, reliability, maintainability. But after a year or two, we got them to where they were. They were good. Can you compare the GPSD with the Minuteman Three? Like, are they similar? Are they different? Uh, well, if I could, I wouldn't be able to tell you because no. Boeing's got their model and Northrop Grumman's got their model, and I'm sure they're using the things that are. Uh, um, Maybe they're using laser gyros. Maybe they're using solid state. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that um, Draper is still developing. Uh, 
have you seen the, the Draper's cold atom? Draper has a guidance system that's built around one atom. You just keep an eye on, you know, when we move this way, the atoms stay here. Oh, it, it actually works. Well, that's not quite ready for ICBMs yet. <laughs> the, the, the guidance systems Draper does for the sea launch ballistic missiles are incredible because the sub doesn't know right, right. anything. So it, it, once it gets out of the orbit, it spots stars mm -hmm. and then orients itself and redirects. It's incredible. That's crazy. Yeah, so I worked on the inertial upper stage when I mentioned that I flew spy satellites into space back in 1983 was the first launch of the IUS. IUS is basically a two or three stage, very short Minuteman. It's built by Boeing. And it had a star scanner in it to improve its attitude and detection. It, basically, you couldn't really update anything about position or velocity, but you could learn a lot about attitude which was very important in, in pre precisely delivering a bomb or a satellite to where it needs to go. Yeah. One of the first things I worked on as an engineer when I worked at Draper was actually a star site data capture system, basically, to read out the data from the uh, CCD. It was actually going to be a CCD device. Yeah, those things are just amazing. There, there was a scheme at one time that if I remember how this worked, you would, it was, oh, I can't remember how, but, it, but you weren't sighting on stars, you were sighting on other things that were moving in orbit with you in order to yeah. increase your precision. Oh, but there was the Voyager. Remember the Voyager where they, when they launched the Voyager, knowing that they couldn't get as precise as they needed to, unless they could discover more moons around Neptune. And so they just bet on the fact that they probably would. And they did. <laughs> okay, I got a Dr. Sustainment. I have a question about sustainment. All right. So go back to your last chart. So you mentioned, you partially answered this question, I think the very last one, Paul, that has the sustainment model on it. Keep yeah, so keep going. All the way to the, the end, near the end. Sure. So you mentioned people as an overlooked element of the system. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead, we're, there's several of us involved at some level, our companies at least, with GPSD. Um, so, you know, Miniman even, they had to pull out all the solid rocket propellant and do a refurb on that halfway yeah. through the life. Well, no, more than once. Or more than once, mm -hmm. right, for Miniman, right, three times, whatever. So. Um, so what other, what are your top three priorities that you would say for GBSD that they're not thinking of from a sustainment perspective? <laughs> I, I know that's a crazy that question. That sounds like a contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on that program, so I'm just curious. <laughs> My first name. thought is I know a lot of those people that are working on it, and they're really, really smart, and they probably are thinking about of, it. of what I'm about to say. But. So are you thinking in terms of sustainability? And yeah, how you make it last 50 years. Yeah. The overall system. Make it upgrade. The, the trick about um, sustainment is uh, when, you're, when you're working on it in the design phase, you know, you're working to a particular schedule and you got your failure modes and effects analysis, and you're pretty much feeling really smart about, you think how everything is going to break and, and uh, but then, when you are finished with your production line and it's deployed and you're in the sustainment space after five or ten years, a couple of peculiar things happen. First of all, you're no longer on a, on a solid schedule like you were in the design phase. You're now on the indefinite. So you have to decide what, how far ahead is lead time ahead to get something fixed. And you don't know the answer to that unless you know how serious the thing is that you're trying to fix. So you have to design an observation or assessment program that lets you see things lead time ahead, and especially the more serious things that might take harder, longer thing to fix. So there's a whole arc around that. The other thing is, once you're in the sustainment phase, you no longer are worried as much about the uh, design baseline or the any of the other configuration baselines that you've been working to in the design phase. 
you're kind of more worried about now the capabilities baseline. And the capabilities baseline is what that operator has gotten used to and thinks his system is going to do every time he uses it. And that may not even be recorded in any design document. But you'd better know what that warfighter is thinking and what's important to him now that he's got it and he's using the mission to do it. Um, and there was a third piece that flashed in my mind too about a very, very big difference between the design phase and the sustainable phase. Configure the um, capabilities baseline, the lead time ahead. Oh, so basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that you always ensure that you've got a contract with whoever your repair depot is. To make sure that they're not just removing and replacing items and getting production through that depot as fast as they can, which is good because you drive costs down. But you also have to answer the question, the thing I fix, does that any, bear any relationship to what broke in the field? Because if you're not drawing, if you're not closing that loop and saying, yeah, the thing I fixed is what broke in the field, then you're probably releasing something back into the field that's just going to break again and you don't understand why. Because so I just fixed it. Say fracas. What's that? You're, you're saying that you need to use fracas. To, to it's, a, it's fracas for the repair depot, which we used to call CLFA. But basically, yeah, go to the old fracas handbook. And every place it says production line, think repair depot. And what you're going to be doing is uh, making sure that uh, you're capturing the information you need to be able to improve your test equipment, improve your data systems, improve your processes at the repair depot. Because your system is always going to come up with more and more clever ways to fail. I can add into that. <clears throat> I was working on JLTV, going on a vehicle program. And oh gosh, no, it was AM General. Oh, yeah. uh, and what we were finding was is that they were taking it out and they were putting something in and testing and breaking and coming back, putting something in and testing and breaking at a constant cycle. So mm -hmm. you really need to make sure that you have a robust reliability program that does the FAMIA or the, the DFAMIA design for uh, the DFAMIA. And <clears throat> when you're going to run a program for this, this kind of light, obsolescence becomes an issue. Because now that you've, you can no longer get the part because somebody stopped making it, the replacement part you have, or that you find, may have different failure modes. So you need to take those into account. So that's that constant churn of. Well, here's another little detail. Usually these emerging failure modes are one or two over a period of years and then they start to get more and more and more. And you start to get to this point here where you go, I think I might start, I think I might be having a problem with this piece that, that I've been removing. Where are all the ones that I used to remove? Well, repair depots that kept those pieces, maybe even put them through a post-mortem analysis, but if they didn't, they at least kept them. Now this guy who's down here can go back, capture all those pieces, maybe draw some conclusion about what's going to happen here. Right. Or, or if you're a very, very efficient repair depot, you've thrown that stuff out a long time ago. Uh, if you're like the Army for the Abrams tank engine, uh, they would disassemble the engine and just throw things in bins. Uh, and then when they went to build the engine back up, they would just pull something out of the yeah, bin yeah. to put it back in, not knowing whether not it even was going to cause it to... No paperwork associated with the part at all. Yeah, my favorite uh, sustainment activity is CLFA because it helps you find that uh, emerging failure mode. What does that stand for? Closed with failure analysis, but it's basically fracas and a repair depot. So material review board becomes a failure review board. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to your um, your thoughts on the ballistic missiles like the deterrent going forward. Um, I imagine you're pretty positive. But what happens in a world where our attack doesn't come in a nuclear in a nuclear fashion or something like that, where it's more subtle, perhaps a cyber strike or right. you know, whatever? Public opinion is not going to let us launch on that. Right? We'll burn just as much, but they won't let us launch. I mean, how does that, what? You know, that's a it's a nonlinear threat, but right. it's very real right now, more so than almost anything else. Right. Um, let me just say, if you go to my website, put in the search box in my blog, CLFA. 
You'll find my papers on the subject. T F C C C F L C C L F A T L F A. Um, so, yeah, so I kind of hinted at the fact that maybe ICBMs isn't what we really need in the year 2040 or 2050. Um, one thing you can think about is as you get more and more and more precise in what you're able to hit, do you really need a nuclear bomb to go off when you hit it? Well, if it's deeply buried, maybe, but maybe not. Um, and then this whole question of uh, cyber attacks. Um, what are you going to do as a retaliation? Well, it, are we still in the same arena that says we need to have some sort of a massive deterrent to make sure they don't cyber attack us? Or do we get smart enough to make sure that all of our systems are hardened enough that no attack is really going to do enough damage? And deterrence may not be the right approach. Right. Defense might be the right, right. approach. Right, hardening. Yeah, yeah. hardening. So, I mean, I mean, we can't solve that here tonight. There's just no, I, I a just, lot of, right. but I, I really look forward to a day when we've really gotten completely rid of all atomic weapons and nuclear weapons because there's just so many bad things that can happen. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm a real proponent for atomic power until we get fusion. I think we should be building nuclear power stations everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree. Okay. Are there any final questions for Charlie? Okay, thanks. I enjoyed it. It's fun. All right. Charlie, thank you. Great. All right, well, thank you for coming. Please uh, grab some food on your way out. I believe there's uh, food still left. Can somebody actually open the box for the manufacturer or something? Or you get the, you can find one. Yeah, that was. Uh,